Hi. Yes, it's auction score time again. And ta-da! Take a look at this. It's a Tower of Agilent. Tower of Hewlett Packard. Tower of Keysight. Oh, goodness, yes. They're called Keysight. Now, anyway, check out what I got. Didn't get it uh, super cheap, uh, but I, you know, I paid, it, paid a decent penny for this stuff, but I think I got some really good bargains in the mix. Check out what I've got. I've got uh, no less than six uh, Agilent, uh, well, I've got five Agilent 6643A, uh, 35 volt, 6 amp DC system uh, power supplies. These are 200 watts a pop, I believe. And I've got one 6642A, which is 0 to 20 volts at 0 to 10 amps. I've also got one of these very nice um, E3646 dual output uh, power supplies. I bid on another one of these, which was a triple output one, but that was going a bit high, so I let that one go. You've got to know when to let them go sometimes, but uh, you can get caught up in that auction fever. But anyway, it's a, these are very nice uh, power supplies, and I've got a Keekly 2400 uh, source meter as well. Fantastic. And I've got uh, two... Um, it, well, HP branded uh, 3488A uh, multiplex switches, and these things, they're practically given away. Nobody wants them. They're practically free, and if you want like a GPIB controlled uh, switch or something like that, these things can actually be quite handy because nobody wants them. So check them out on eBay. They are, we might uh, open one up. Uh, in later or in another video, you can actually score some good uh, parts out of these. But these system power supplies, I really love these. These are great. Now the issue with these power supplies is that they do actually go quite cheap, and it is a way to get a really good bench supply because these are super high quality. These Agilent still sell these. These are worth like over three thousand. I think about thirty three hundred Australian dollars each uh, for these things if you bought them brand new these days but uh, yeah because they're a system power supply the connections are on the back so they don't have banana uh, plugs on the front but there are you can actually get in there and feel that there are holes in there for the binding post terminal so I'm going to actually look at maybe uh, modifying these to put the binding posts on the front to make them much more useful but these are fantastic system power supplies they cost a lot of money for a reason they're superbly engineered they're super uh, fast response and um, super low noise and just great uh, system or DC power supplies and this beauty I got an Infinium 1.5 gig uh, bandwidth, 8 gig samples per second, 4 channel scope, and these Infiniums can actually uh, go for quite decent prices if you're after like a super high bandwidth, uh, analog bandwidth stuff, these aren't a bad option at all. Not, uh, this is the, um, uh, I can't remember the model number, it's not actually on here, but this series uh, doesn't have a huge amount of memory, it's only got 64k memory per channel or 60k per uh, channel or something like that but that's more than good enough uh, when you're talking about this sort of bandwidth to do some great analysis on so there you go um <laughs> quite a decent score obviously i'm not going to keep all this stuff but i just love i just couldn't resist picking up this stuff at auction there's a whole ton of stuff which went for some of them went for crazy uh prices but uh yeah this is what i managed to pick up in the bidding frenzy anyway so I'm pretty happy with it, so let's take a closer look. Now, all this stuff comes from a company that's gone into liquidation. It is uh, Precision Mechatronics, and they were actually a spin-off from uh, Silverbrook uh, Research. If you're familiar with Silverbrook Research, I've talked about them before. An absolutely crazy company uh, run by, well, a crazier person. And there's no surprise here that uh, some of the other gear is also branded uh, Silverbrook uh, Research on it. So obviously they were uh, swapping gear and uh, stuff like that, but this is where it all comes from. Now this is rather interesting. One of the power supplies here has property of VentraCore Limited, and they're a uh, medical uh, device company that went into. I remember their liquidation auction. Like I don't know how many years ago it was. Quite a few, maybe three, four years ago, or something like that. Maybe even longer. But uh, yeah, obviously, um, I'm not sure if they were affiliated with uh, Silverbrook and the other uh, branch off companies at all. I didn't think so from memory, but um, yeah, maybe they, um, well, somebody from the company uh, picked up a lot of this gear from, or some of this gear from the VentraCore liquidation auction. So, 
what goes around comes around. And the oscilloscope actually comes from an American uh, equipment uh, reseller, like a rental, you know, like a, maybe a surplus equipment seller, Avalon uh, test in the US. So, yeah, maybe they actually picked up a lot of this stuff um, secondhand and just salvaged it from anywhere they could, which is rather interesting. They didn't buy them brand new. And the reason why a lot of this uh, stuff went for uh, big dollars is not only are there a lot of dealers uh, at these auction uh, things like uh, test equipment dealers who like to buy stuff in bulk and they're, bulk and they're very uh, cashed up and stuff like that. So they'll often outbid you. But also I was talking to a guy there. He was picking up uh, some stuff and he used to work for Precision Mechatronics. And he said, yeah, it all closed down in a hurry and everyone who worked there all wanted stuff and things like that. So, um, yeah, there was a lot a bidding frenzy on this stuff but these system DC power supplies if you haven't seen them are, uh, are you know are quite nice they're not like a regular lab bench supply they are exactly designed for what they um, say they are like a system you know GPIB uh, you know computer controlled uh, power supply but look see they've got there's some holes in the front depressions in in there there's one down there so I'm I'm not sure, but uh, I, I think there might be a chance that uh, maybe we can install. I'm not sure if they're designed for binding posts. I don't think so. I've never seen like an option or anything for them, but they've got some sort of hole in the front panel. But even if they didn't, um, yeah, I'd be looking at uh, maybe drilling some holes in the uh, front panel of this thing. And they were last calibrated in uh, 2008, uh, due in 2009, so not particularly new. But anyway, um, no, these power supplies there, I guarantee you pretty much all of this stuff is going to work. I'd be very surprised if any of it doesn't work. And here's what's on the back of here. We've just got some uh, big heat sinks. There's a fan on the inside which pushes all the uh, air out. And we've got some uh, digital uh, control. Um, stuff here. We've got uh, J1 and J2. There's some sort of uh, uh, you know control interface or output. I can't remember exactly uh, why I haven't used one of these in a long, long time. And uh, GPIB, of course. And this is a uh, 240 volt uh, unit only, local and remote uh, current sensing as well. And here is really the only major thing I don't uh, like about these is that the output terminal block, look, this is loose. So, um, you know, and it's directly PCB mounted on there, and I, yeah, I'm not sure whether or not that's just the connector itself, or whether or not the solder joint is actually uh, loose, it might just be the connector, but yeah, um, that's the thing, you know, I don't really, uh, they're just, they're great when you have them mounted in a rack, and this is what they're designed to do, is mount in a rack, and then you wire it into your, uh, you know, your ATE, automated uh, test equipment, and uh, stuff like that, but yeah, um, as a general uh, bench supply, it's really annoying to have the uh, terminals on the back, but it's got the um, sense line, so you can do remote uh, sense and stuff like that. And some auction houses are really bloody annoying. They put these horrible, uh, like, almost like security type stickers. They do actually have, like, a metallic uh, back in some of them. And they stick them on and they never come off in, uh, cleanly. And, yeah, so if you're looking to resell these things on eBay, I'll just have a generally clean machine. You've got uh, to clean these things up. I love it. For engineering use only, you're damn right. Um, companies will p typically put uh, for engineering use only if they just couldn't give a rat's ass about uh, actually calibrating the thing and maintaining the calibration and um, you know stuff like that's not being used for production or you know it's just used for a jig that you know isn't really taking critical uh, uh, measurements or something like that or in this case actually uh, supplying power and things like that so they'll typically you know stick a sticker on like that and that's probably why it you know hasn't been calibrated since uh, you know 2008. All right, let's power one of these puppies up. As I said, I'm pretty darn confident. I'd be very surprised if any of this stuff has actually uh, failed because the company, you know, they shut down in a hurry. It would have been pulled straight off the uh, factory uh, floor or the test um, center or the R&D center or something like that. So here we go. Address two. That's good. It's boot in and bang, we're straight in. Look at that. And uh, they do have uh, rotary encoder knobs not that huge a resolution because this is you know I got 0 to 35 volts this comes in various models the 6641A the 42A the 43 and uh, maybe there's a couple of others too so yeah right down at that low end it's a little bit I can you know tweak it a bit but for a 0 to 35 volt uh, supply 
that's pretty good and then we can set our uh, current limit of course it won't uh, show up there because we have to actually um, put it uh, short it out or put it into a set current uh, display mode and then we've got various uh, displays we can actually display the voltage and here we go we can actually display the set current there so we don't actually have to uh, short the output uh, so that'll go up to all the way to uh, constant current of uh, 6 amps. As I said, I believe these are a 200 watt uh, total system power supply and they've got over voltage protection here so you can uh, set that so it won't go over voltage, got over current protection and uh, you can turn, turn the protection off and on and it's got an output uh, on off, switch disable, constant voltage, const constant current display, you know, it, it's not that it's not as easy to use as a regular uh, bench supply but hey you know if you've got one of these in your lab you certainly wouldn't be complaining and of course then you can uh, it's got voltage up down buttons and then you can type in so with your voltage if we want to do uh, you know 5.000 volts no problems whatsoever there we go it jumps back to our displayed value and that's actually not the set value that's actually the actual measured output voltage so I'm pretty confident we'll actually get 5 volts on the output and there you go that's good enough for me that's set for a value of uh, precisely 10 volts output and that's exactly what we're getting and it's reading a smidgen high half a bee's dick one of the other downsides to this unit is unfortunately the relatively noisy little fan in there which is a uh, you know, pretty much uh, just trying to push everything out. Not sure if it's a variable speed or not, but uh, yeah, it is pretty whiny. So if you really, if you had a lot of these things running in a rack, they can, you know, really churn out some noise. Um, so yeah, you might might want to replace it maybe with one of the more modern uh, silent fans. But if you wanted to push it near its uh, maximum 200 watt capability, you'd just have to be careful that you got the airflow right. As I said, I do like these bench, uh, these comp more compact, well, they're quite high uh, units, but they, you know, relatively uh, compact form factor compared to the, uh, you know, the 19-inch rack ones like these. So these ones do actually, and they're shorter as well, so these do actually fit well on a uh, test equipment shelf. And, yeah, this one's only the dual output one. As I said, I did bid on the, uh, the triple output uh, one, but it went uh, too high. I probably could have got one um, easily otherwise for the same price but anyway the, the problem with this this only has a single output uh, display so you can only display one of the outputs voltage and current at any one time so you know really having a triple one is probably maybe a bit overkill anyway still very handy two isolated outputs um, it's switchable ranges of course uh, because it's a linear uh, supply and size so it changes the uh, tap so 0 to 8 volts at uh, 3 amps per channel and 0 to 20 volts at 1.5 amps per channel I think it's like a 60 watt uh, power supplies and on the arse end here we've got RS232 interface very nice um, you know handy if you don't have GPIB of course your standard uh, GPIB interface and also uh, your outputs here where you'll notice the jumper links to uh, return the um, just to somebody's used those to short the sense outputs this is the uh, 230 volt uh, well it's set for the 230 volt fuse I'm not sure if they're actually uh, switchable inside but let's power it up here we go ka-chunk Woohoo! Vacuum fluorescent display, output off, bingo! <laughs> like a winner. So, yeah, you've got to actually um, choose your out one, out two. It's not that great. It would have been nice if there was like a lead here to tell you uh, which one, you know, A is the output on or off, and B, um, you know, which one is actually being displayed up there. But I guess you've got to look at the display anyway. So, uh, you know, anyway, it's <laughs> it's not that terrific. Uh, low, high, you can store and stall and store and recall uh, stuff and um, output on and off and there it is so we can just wind the wick up on that puppy and that isn't the set uh, voltage which is a little bit annoying it is actually the um, output voltage rather than the set voltage and then of course I don't like the way that they just dim the digit there it's not that terrific but anyway there you go you can actually wind up that and there's no velocity uh, control on these but even so these are really really great performance uh, uh, supplies and they're well worth having and you know it's not a bad interface it could have been better but eh. and once again of course it's going to be pretty darn close to spot on you could actually even probably uh, software calibrate the thing if you were that keen but uh, yeah we can just jump between uh, input one and input two and as I said all this stuff is going to work I can you know if you want to fully test it of course you get out your load and actually uh, test the thing under the load but eh, I'm pretty darn sure they're going to be fine 
If we go into the view here, we can uh, actually go into uh, display and we can go into firmware revision. And there we go, 1.7, 5.0, uh, no idea. Anyway, we can uh, go back in there and we can go cow string. Find out when it was last calibrated. Factory cow was 26th of August, 2010. And these ones aren't hugely quiet, but they're not as noisy and whiny as the uh, system uh, supply we saw down here because it, a, it's got a bigger fan and I'm not sure if it's uh, rotating slower or has a, should have a variable speed on the thing. But anyway, you could actually replace that with a modern uh, silent one. No problems whatsoever. And I'm going to keep this one, so I will uh, definitely do that. I think I'll just replace it with a silent one. It's going to be a standard uh, size fan, so it should be no problem whatsoever. Now I'm very excited about this one, an Agilent Infinium uh, uh, 54845A. It doesn't have the model number on the front, uh, but it's on the back. And uh, it's part of the uh, 54800 uh, series, 1.5 gig analog bandwidth. There you go, at 8 gig samples per second. Brilliant. So this is by far the highest performance uh, oscilloscope, well bandwidth uh, oscilloscope I've got in the lab. I do have the 1 gig uh, tech MDO 3000 but yeah this thing 1.5 gig and yes I do actually have a uh, probe to uh, go with it I haven't actually looked in the top yet I haven't opened up I thought I'd save that for on uh, camera but I do have uh, this uh, nice Agilent uh, 2 gig um, active probe which I could actually uh, use for this thing if I decide to keep it now to me this is one of the best laid out oscilloscope front panels ever why well look at these verticals they're all lined up with the BNC here, you've got separate controls for all four channels, nothing to get in the way, no clutter. You've got your on off switch right above here, then you've got your uh, position control above that, then you've got your coupling AC and DC, separate switch exactly where you want it, then you've got your input uh, termination 50 ohms, one meg, then you've got your uh, scale adjust, and up here you've got your horizontal, which is a physically bigger knob. It should be the biggest knob on the scope, the horizontal, always, um, otherwise it's a fail you've got your delayed uh, button there effectively your uh, zoom uh, function you've got your horizontal adjust and then your separate trigger or you know like nothing really to get in the way and all the stuff you need with the lights right above them look at this your mode you've got edge trigger glitch trigger advanced and then you've got your source one two three four ox and line you've got your uh, slope positive or negative then you've got whether you want your uh, a single sweep or your auto trigger mode and then you've got your various uh, coupling um, and filters here and then your run stop up the top completely out of the way yes it does have a three and a half inch uh, floppy on here for storing stuff but you could most likely replace that with one of these modern USB uh, key ones as I've uh, mentioned before so and it's got the original covers on the aux out and the aux trigger in and it doesn't look like it's had much use at all so apart from but the knob up here very common let me show you this now these knobs look pretty crusty, but this is uh, unfortunately very common with these sort of like a rubber type uh, buttons used on these uh, Agilent gear. But you can actually uh, clean these up with some isopropanol uh, wipes and a bit of uh, elbow grease. So, you know, they should clean up. But yeah, that's one of the only, you know, major problems with uh, getting a secondhand Agilent with these uh, rubber buttons they do tend to show just that all that grime from the fingers and everything else just you know easily gets onto these controls if we get in there with a isopropanol wipe and a bit of elbow, elbow grease you can see that stuff starting to come off no problems whatsoever so that'll clean up like a bought one now here we go, this could make or break, well I can already um, sell this thing for like maybe four or five times what I paid for it, but uh, maybe if we're lucky this feels like it's got some stuff in it, so I'm hoping there's some probes in here, I haven't opened it yet, but let's uh, have a look and maybe like if it's got like an active probe or something like that, hey that could easily sell for more than what I paid for it, so let's have a look, we've got ourselves some... What are they? Some ground clips or something like that. What have we got inside here? Cow certificate would be my guess. That's classic cow certificate. Ta-da! Certificate of calibration. There we go. Um, Agilent uh, Avalon Equipment uh, Corp in the US. And uh, that was done 2005. So yeah, that was uh, 
quite some time ago, but yep, it was working back then, and I'm sure it's still working now. And by the way, yes, I did get the original front cover with this thing. Awesome. And you'll notice that uh, even though it's got Agilent on the front, this thing still has Hewlett Packard. They couldn't be bothered uh, changing their moldings there for a while. So anyway, nothing else left in there. So we've got a replacement retractable hook pack, um, Tyco. So let's go into the main thing here. I expect there to be a manual. Uh, what do we got? Hey, we've got some probes. We've got some probes. Let's have a look. There you go. We've got some uh, 1161 A's. Let me check the bandwidth of those suckers. Oh, look at this score. This is what you're hoping you'll get when you buy an oscilloscope at auction like this. Got four original uh, probes. Unfortunately, not all the uh, same. I've got three 1161A passive uh, probes. These are designed for this uh, one, but they're a, a times 10 divider uh, probe, of course, with your standard uh, 9 meg resistor um, inside here. So it's just your regular passive probe. They're 500 megahertz bandwidth each. So I've got uh, three of those pretty good probes in their own right. Um, this one here, though, is an 1163A, also a passive probe. You can tell it's a passive probe because of the uh, construction of the uh, probe is just normal. There's obviously no um, electronics um, in there. And of course, yeah, you've got your no uh, no power coming across here. You've just got your regular uh, times ten um, test selection thing there. But anyway, this is a uh, 1.5 gigahertz bandwidth. Uh, passive probe, but instead of having your usual nine meg resistor in here, it's got. Um, designed for a uh, 50 ohm input so you've got to use this in 50 ohm mode of course to get the uh, bandwidth so it's got a low value resistor in series it's, it works exactly the same principle that times 10 resistive divider exactly like your regular uh, oscilloscope probes here but just higher bandwidth so this one is 1.5 gig beautiful that one sells second hand on ebay for a hundred bucks in its own right so pretty darn happy with that i've got a few um I, as i said i've got the, uh, a few spare original uh hooks for it and a set of uh, ground lead original ground leads as well and these nice little adapters which go to the uh, pin headers like that so you just slide these over like this you just slide that over the top like that and bingo you can go to your pin headers or um and and i've got some uh, easy hooks as well so you can just go there uh, put those on so i've got four of those and a couple of spare tips as well oh what a score and this high frequency uh, passive probe by the way it's got a kevlar reinforced cable on it 1.5 picofarads uh, input capacitance at the tip and a and a as i said 1.5 gig bandwidth but they actually specify that as a total system bandwidth including the scope itself so beautiful and i got a compact keyboard as well a couple of mice power cord and an ethernet cable and yes this thing does run windows and it's actually got a lot of uh, fancy stuff uh, obviously you can network it but it's also got uh, voice command as well i believe that's like a software option not sure if this one has it so you can actually say you know change vertical on channel one two something you know expand horizontal or something like that and you can actually voice command the thing and and you can get it to email you every time it uh, triggers and it captures the screen and things like that so really sort of you know powerful network functionality in these things uh, of course afforded by the fact that it runs windows and here goes the big test let's power it on but once again i'd be very surprised if it didn't work there's some stuff i think i need to maybe take that front panel off. there's a lot of uh uh, crap sort of like inside the front screen on that but oh, anyway here we go <laughs> the floppy drive woohoo there we go the bias so the motherboards all working everything award bias blah 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 come on you can do it it's going to take a while it is windows you know <laughs> so Come on, starting Windows 98, there we go, it runs Windows 98. Microsoft RAM disk version 3.06. Let's have a look. Come on. You can do it. This is why you don't want to use this as an everyday scope, you know, to, like, just the sheer size and the weight of it. 
Of course, the fan makes a bit of noise on it. It's not horrible like that, uh, you know, a 90,000 se Agilent 90,000 series scope that was practically a, um, you know, a, you know, a jet engine in the back of the thing to try and keep it cool. But, uh, oh, actually, should it take this long? I think I can still hear the hard drive going, but, uh, yeah, 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 it's still going. Infinium, there we go. You beauty. And, of course, we can get the mouse out and, ah, oh, network password. Bugger off. Windows is updated as a result of daylight saving. Oh, yeah, goodness. See, not an everyday use scope. Ah, oh, bugger off. Here we go. Just get me in there. And yes, it uses the old uh, uh, DIN connector keyboard and uh, PS2 for the keyboard and a PS2 connection for the mouse. Oh, goodness. But hey, you can't complain about the performance of this thing. 1.5 gig bandwidth, 8 gig samples per second, which are, and uh, 64K uh, sample memory per channel, which uh, halves if you turn on all the uh, channels. And I'm sure the uh, sample rate might uh, halve as well. But, come on, you can do it. It's running some self-tests. I can hear the relays, and we're in like Flynn. We're in. Look at that. That's, you know, this is actually a really quite a responsive uh, scope. So, you know, no problems whatsoever. And yes, beauty, I have confirmed that all four channels do actually work. One of the annoying aspects of this, you sort of like, a, you know, plug and unplug that probe, and it resets all the channels. For example... If I go down here like this, I've already set that up. I can trigger off uh, channel 2 here. They make it quite accessible in that respect. But you go back to channel 1 and uh, it's all reset itself. There you go. A little bit annoying. But anyway, that's what it does when you uh, swap the probes in and out. But yeah, they've tried to take away, because this is a Windows interface, they have tried to take away the pain with a really usable uh, front panel here. But the only downside, of course, is that if you want to do anything else, if you want to actually go into, uh, you know, menus that you're used to, I mean, you know, where is the menu button on this thing to call up the menu and go in and your regular soft buttons that you're used to on the oscilloscope, stuff like that. So anything more advanced? No, unfortunately, you've got to use the uh, mouse and the keyboard. So I found that the uh, PS2 mouse didn't work for some reason. I just plugged in the uh, a USB mouse here and it's automatically uh, detected it there. So hopefully we can go in and uh, search for uh, the driver. Yeah, just do it. Just do it. Next. Bloody hell. <laughs> Finish. Yay. And do we have a mouse? Do we have a mouse? We have a mouse. We ha oh. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the interesting thing. The mouse is limiting my movement to just that corner up there. Because it doesn't, because there's nothing else for the mouse to actually click on here. So it's limiting just that little region up there. So there we go. So I have to go in here and then we've got all of our stuff over here that you might be more familiar with that you would call up with uh, soft buttons on the side and stuff like that. But then we've got our full so we can go between that waveform view where you don't, you know, you don't have any clutter on the uh, screen, no menus or anything like that. You can't do anything straight over to the graphical user interface. So do they call that waveform mode? It's full screen interface mode and graphical user interface mode. There we go. And then we can um, uh, do uh, measurements and uh, do all sorts of stuff like that. Frequency channel 1, for example. So we can call that up. There it is, but because we haven't triggered, let me, boom, there it is. Near enough. And look at the update rate on here. It's absolutely phenomenal. The... Uh, that update rate is incredible. If we have a look through some of the controls here, we can just email a screenshot. That's pretty handy once you've uh, set up your network, of course. I need to uh, set that up. And uh, control, well, you know, look, we don't need to uh, do that sort of stuff with the mouse, do we? And then we can set up uh, the channel one and do uh, uh, various things. But there's nothing we can't really do there except for, like, uh, set up probes and uh, stuff like that, maybe... Uh, um, set up the uh, skew as well, perhaps, and then we've got horizontal, and you know, it's it's not that great, it is a dicky old Windows interface, so if you want to do anything apart from just your regular um, stuff at all, then, you know, you got to be um, willing to play around with this, so we can jump into equivalent time uh, sampling, of course, real time, and uh, 
8 gig, there we go, configuration 64k points, that's why it wasn't showing 8 gig up there, so we can close that, uh, sign X on X, yeah, we can turn that on, we've got a 9 bit uh, bandwidth limit, what else have we got, well, sampling rate when set to automatic, memory depth automatic or memory or manual, uh, we can turn our averaging mode on, that's you know, it's something that you're sort of used to setting up on your uh, scope relatively easily um, that you can't really do on this one. So that's a little bit annoying. And uh, close. Let's have a look. What else have we got? So if we expand that right out now, we should find that we can go up to 8 gig sample per second. And if I turn on the second, so I've got channels 1 and 3 on at the moment. If I turn on channel 2, channel 2 is not available in... Yeah, it's not available in this acquisition configuration. We're gonna it won't even you know why won't if I press the channel two button, why won't it just automatically default to that? I've now got to go into this uh, uh, acquisition menu and physically change it, you know, down here so it allows me to use the other channels. Just yeah, it really is quite annoying. It's just you know not designed for an everyday use scope, but once again, you can't complain about the performance. And we can do uh, eye pattern uh, stuff as well, jitter and all sorts of things like that. So, you know, really, it does, uh, you, this scope can do like USB uh, characterization and uh, stuff like that. So, that's pretty neat. So, we can go into our eye definition here and maybe we can uh, get an eye diagram up. And to turn on your eye diagram, you've got to go actually into uh, setup, into your display setup here, and then turn on the color grade function. And uh, you know, it, it does actually get quite painful. For, so then you've got your color intensity graded display that you might be uh, used to. So there we go. And now we should be able to start getting the more advanced stuff up. But yeah, it's pretty painful for anything advanced. But hey, this is designed as a high performance measurement tool not an everyday use scope. So there we go, we can find out stuff like the uh, jitter of our calibration signal on the front panel is around about 13.28 nanoseconds RMS. Go figure, Stand with a standard deviation, 100 and, oh there we go, 137 picoseconds. Jeez. Alright, let's go into the self-test here and uh, pass, 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 please disconnect all probes, yada yada yada, and uh, start test, here we go. And as I said, I do expect it to uh, pass pretty... Uh, A to D converter, passed. Testing the FISO, passed. Offset DAC, beautiful. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Surely. Ah, uh, this could take a while. I'll come back when it's done. And wow, yep, no kidding. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. This oscilloscope is like a bought one. So yes, as much as I would uh, like to keep this puppy, I <laughs> really can't see myself uh, using it much. I've already got a 1 gig scope, so going to 1.5 gig, eh, you know, um, and it is worth a pretty penny, so I might actually uh, just uh, well, fully uh, test it. Of course, although uh, once you pass all those power-on tests, test all four channels just with a basic signal, you know, 99.9% .9 confident it's going to uh, uh, pass all its uh, performance stuff, really. So, you know, it, it is a winner, and I can't really justify it. It's because ultimately this is not like an everyday use scope. It is a the scope you pull out when you want to do a really specialised high performance measurement and analysis and uh, stuff like that. Because it's just too big and too deep and too noisy. And even though it does have a really nice usable interface uh, front panel, if you want to do anything advanced with it, it's just, you know, hopeless with the uh, Windows interface and it takes forever to boot and... Well, you know, ultimately I've got a one point, uh, I've already got a one gig uh, scope uh, sitting in the lab that's, you know, completely usable. I mean, look at this, right? It's just, <laughs> right, it's a much, um, you know, a better, more modern, more usable scope. It's absolutely uh, uh, tiny and, uh, you know, so, yeah, really, it's hard to justify keeping that, I'm afraid. Ah, oh, well. And last but certainly not least, a Keithley 2400 uh, SMU. I really wanted uh, one of these, so yep, this is probably a keeper. Let's power it on and uh, hopefully she works. Model 2 revision C26 there, and uh, yep, I mean, you know, it's not like the fancy new model, but hey, if you just want the performance, 
it's still there. Terrific uh, front back uh, terminals, of course, and uh, I have no doubt this puppy's going to work. And yep, there you go. That one's good enough for me as an initial test. It's working. And yep, the current as well. There we go. Uh, sourcing 100 uh, microamps there. And yep, pretty darn close. So looks like we have a winner. Now, as far as this uh, Hewlett Packard 3488A switch control unit here goes, I'm going to power it on here. As I said, these are uh, rather, <coughs> you know, these are practically given away on eBay and really there's nothing fancy in these things all it is is a is a basically a uh, GPIB with a uh, processor and a display and then uh, just some uh, you know uh, stuff to select your channel but it's all about the plug-in modules on the back and it's basically a multiplexer where you can uh, depends on the modules that you got uh, configured in the thing you can actually um, uh, pretty much switch anything uh, up to like you know one and a half gig I think uh, you can get one and a half gig cards to switch RF stuff or you can switch low signal stuff and you know low noise things and stuff like that so it's all about the modules and if we press the test button there and uh, there we go it's a self test okay so yep there's nothing wrong with this sucker at all and as I wouldn't expect it and you can basically pick these up for the cost of shipping so let's take a look at the back so this one looks like it has uh, five of the same modules in it and they are uh, triple four seven three a four by four matrix uh, switches and this is still actually a current product you can still buy this card inside this thing for like 1200 bucks and yes all it is is a bunch of relays pretty much so yeah that's you know agilent price gouging at its best so just there you know these things where if you bought them new would have cost an absolute fortune and here's some of the specs for it. There we go. Input uh, like thermal offset. Here we go. Uh, three microvolts, 43 channels per second. Relay life, uh, 10 to the power of 8. Uh, 250 volt, uh, 2 amp per module, 8 amp maximum. So it can, you know, switch like 60 watts per channel and uh, stuff like that. And uh, open channel to channel, 5 puff and all that sort of stuff. So um, DC isolation, uh, 10 to the power of 11, which uh, sounds like a lot, but when you uh, put a lot of these things in parallel, I've done a very, very old video on it that you can uh, really come a guts of there. But uh, there you go, insertion, crosstalk, all that sort of jazz. Anyway, let's take one out. And they've really spared no expense on this thing. Look, it's um, shielded. They've got these nice, I don't know if they're custom uh, terminal uh, block interfaces, but, you know, like really quite nice. Let's have a look under here. But like I said, it's pretty much just relays. And there we go. We've got uh, Japanese Aramat uh, relays in this thing. High quality stuff. Got a whole bunch of them. So it is a 4x4 uh, switching matrix. Just them, uh, you know, some 74 series and some uh, driver stuff to drive these things. So nothing fancy in these things at all. But if you can pick up a fully populated one of these, you know, like this one that's got five of these cards in it. You know, then, hey, that's a pretty good part salvage if you can pick up these things because they give them away at the cost of postage almost. So, yeah, keep an eye out for them. And then inside there, we've just got some uh, terminal blocks where you can attach stuff. And look, you can see that there are obviously attached some uh, coax on here, which somebody has then just gone, ah, oh, well, let's rip this out of the system. <laughs> Don't want to take it apart. Just cut the cables. Oh, and just look inside one of these HP power supplies. Not going to do a full tear down, but they're just beautiful. The MJ1503 uh, 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 power transistors here. As you said, look, a standard fan there. You could probably just uh, replace that. Look at that beautiful transformer. And look at the wiring of the separate boards. They're using RJ11 uh, connectors to go between boards for control. And oh, it's just oh, it's beautiful. Anyway, is there a hole in the front? Let's have a look. And there's the output connector down in there. As I said, look, it wiggles and, yep, that is a fault. Yeah, that we've got some uh, dry or broken joints there. So, uh, yeah, that needs to be uh, fixed up. That's one of the big downsides of this thing. But anyway, this is, oh, it's just gorgeous built inside. Look at all that. Look at all that wiring. Oh, and yep, check that out down in there. We've got some sort of like a... You know, like a keyhole kind of uh, cutout for two, uh, two big-ass binding posts there. I'm not sure of the exact, uh, you know, they've got 
sort of like ears on the side there, if you can see that anyway. There's two of them, they're not quite identical by the way, um, but yeah, still we should be able to uh, just uh, punch out that front there, because it's only just the, um, the stick on deck or on the front, and uh, find a suitable big ass binding post to mount on the front, and then just wire it uh, through of course, plenty of room just to wire it, and uh, solder it straight onto the output connector up there. No, hold on to your hat, look at that. Two front panel binding posts. They haven't got the output uh, caps there, but there's no reason why. You couldn't take that board out. Solder in the uh, output uh, caps. Is that an output re uh, resistor? I'm not sure what's, uh, what's going on there. Maybe um, that could be a, uh, I don't know, a load or something. But anyway, um, yeah, there's no reason why. Um, this thing, Well, it was designed to have uh, binding posts on the front, but I can't say I've ever seen a model that actually has them. Maybe there is, but uh, maybe it is an official Agilent uh, option. So I'm going to have to do a bit of research um, on exactly what uh, binding posts will fit in that uh, kind of connector uh, cutout down on the bottom there. But uh, there you go. It's uh, designed to do that. And ta-da! Check it out. I found the schematic and the service manual, which I'll link in down below, and I will have to do a separate video on here. But here are the output terminals. Here, here we go. Here's the terminal block on the back, those uh, screw terminals. But yeah, here's the binding post terminals on the PCB like that. And look, there's those two capacitors that we saw, which I'll show you. They're just um, suppression down to uh, mains earth there, the chassis. That's the chassis uh, earth symbol there. And here's the output coming from the big uh, current sense resistor here. And it comes out here. And then to get to these binding posts, you've got to install these three resistors here and otherwise you don't get anything out of those uh, binding posts and there you go you can just wire that in parallel you don't necessarily need the uh, AC um, suppression caps because they're already here check it out they're already there uh, going to chassis earth so you know you could put them in if you really wanted to but not a huge deal so all we have got to do is install those three resistors and uh, Bingo! So there you go, the two suppression caps, you can see it's going down to the chassis there, there's a screw holding the board directly down to the chassis, so there's those two caps, and I have measured that uh, this output uh, negative goes through to the uh, negative uh, rail of course, just like it shows on the schematic, so that, that is connected through to the back terminal, but this one is not, so we have to install those three resistors, and I found them! And as it turns out, they're all the way over here, and check it out, this is some sort of programming resistor here. I haven't looked at like option program resistor. That's interesting, that might be worth uh, having a look at. I haven't uh, read the manual in any detail to find out what that is. But you know, it's pretty significant. And they've gone to all the trouble to um, look, have different like uh, part numbers. So maybe that uh, configures, you know, a, a model option or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, here's these three resistors. So little, you know, piss ant ones. So install three of those. But hey, it's going to be good enough for uh, six amps. And that will connect um, through to the front panel. Uh, through to that binding post. So you don't have to run any messy wiring like over the top of the board or anything like that. It's already there. So just take the board out, install those three, and Bob's your uncle. And check out that uh, four terminal current shut resistor on the output there. Isn't that a beauty made by uh, Dale? 50 milliohms there. Yeah, it's only 1%. It doesn't have to be a tight tolerance one because they calibrate the thing in software. But you can bet your bottom dollar that one's a very low Temco. And for those looking to buy one of these uh, internationally, then yeah, it looks like it has the voltage selection all built in with all the uh, taps here. Here's all the primary uh, taps. So yeah, that uh, they can select it, and the selection switches are, ta-da, there we go, on the side of the unit, so you've got to take the uh, top cover off to find them. So there you go, I hope you uh, like that little look at all this uh, test equipment porn from auction here, and yeah, I'll probably do a couple of more uh, videos on this in due course, upgrading the uh, power supply there, and uh, maybe doing the odd uh, full teardown as well. If you're interested, uh, please let me know in the comments. Catch you next time.